Good evening, and welcome to Ghastly Tales. Tonight's story dates back to 1867 and was first published in the magazine Belgravia in January of that year. It's written by Mary Elizabeth Braddon, who was known for her novels at the time, but she did write a handful of ghost stories, and they are excellent. And so, tonight, let's dim the lights, sit back, and enjoy Evelyn's Visitant. It was at a masked ball at the Palais Royal that my fatal quarrel with my first cousin, Andre de Bissac, began. The quarrel was about a woman. The women who followed the footsteps of Philip of Orleans were the causes of many such disputes, and there was scarcely one fair head in all that glittering throng which, to a man versed in social histories and mysteries, might not have seemed bedabbled with blood. I shall not record the name of her, for love of whom André de Brissac and I crossed one of the bridges in the dim August dawn on our way to the waste ground beyond the church of Saint Germain des Prés. There were many beautiful vipers in those days, and she was one of them. I can feel the chill breath of that August morning blowing in my face as I sit in my dismal chamber at my chateau of Poi Verdun tonight, alone in the stillness, writing the strange story of my life. I can see the white mist rising from the river, the grim outline of the Châtelet and the the square towers of Notre Dame, black against the pale grey sky. Even more vividly can I recall André's fair young face as he stood opposite to me, with his two friends, scoundrels both, and alike eager for that unnatural fray. We were a strange group to be seen in a summer sunrise, all of us fresh from the heat and clamour of the Regent's saloons. André, in a quaint hunting dress, copied from a family portrait at Poi Verdun, I costumed as one of Law's Mississippi Indians. The other men in like garish frippery, adorned with broideries and jewels that looked worn in the pale light of dawn. Our quarrel had been a fierce one, a quarrel which could have but one result, and that the direst. I had struck him, and the welt raised by my open hand was crimson upon his fair, womanish face as he stood opposite to me. The eastern sun shone on the face presently, and dyed the cruel marks with a deeper red, but the sting of my own wrongs was fresh. I had not yet learned to despise myself for that brutal outrage. To André de Brissac, such an insult was most terrible. He was the favourite of fortune, the favourite of women, and I was nothing. A rough soldier who had done my country good service, but in the boudoir of a parabere, a mannerless boor. We fought, and I wounded him mortally. Life had been very sweet for him, and I think that a frenzy of despair took possession of him when he felt the lifeblood ebbing away. He beckoned me to him as he lay on the ground. I went and knelt at his side. Forgive me, André, I murmured. He took no more heed of my words than that if the pietist entreaty had been the idle ripple of the river near at hand. Listen to me, Hector de Brassac, he said. I am not one who believes that a man has done with earth because his eyes glaze and his jaw stiffens. They will bury me in the old vault at Poi Verdun, and you will be master of the chateau. Ah, I know how lightly they take things in these days, and how Dubois will laugh when he hears that Ka has been killed in a duel. They will bury me, and sing masses for my soul, but you and I have not finished our affair yet, my cousin. 
I will be with you when you least look to see me. I, with this ugly scar upon the face that women have praised and loved, and I will come to you when your life seems brightest. I will come between you and all that you hold fairest and dearest. My ghostly hand shall drop a poison in your cup of joy. My shadowy form shall shut the sunlight from your life. Men with such iron will as mine can do what they please, Hector de Brassac. It is my will to haunt you when I am dead. All this in short, broken sentences he whispered into my ear. I had need to bend my ear close to his dying lips, but the iron will of André de Brassac was strong enough to do battle with death. And I believe he said all he wished to say before his head fell back upon the velvet cloak they had spread beneath him, never to be lifted again. As he lay there, he would have fancied him a fragile stripling, too fair and frail for the struggle called life. But there are those who remember the brief manhood of André de Brissac and who can bear witness to the terrible force of that proud nature. I stood looking down at the young face with that foul mark upon it, and God knows I was sorry for what I had done. Of those blasphemous threats which he had whispered in my ear, I, I took no heed. I was a soldier and a believer. There was nothing absolutely dreadful to me in the thought that I had killed this man. I had killed many men on the battlefield, and this one had done me cruel wrong. My friends would have had me cross the frontier to escape the consequences of my act, but I was ready to face those consequences, and I remained in France. I kept aloof from the court, and received a hint that I had best confine myself to my own province. Many masses were chanted in the little chapel of Poiverdun for the soul of my dead cousin, and his coffin filled a niche in the vault of our ancestors. His death had made me a rich man, and the thought that it was so made my newly acquired wealth very hateful to me. I lived a lonely existence in the old chateau, where I rarely held converse with any but the servants of the household, all of whom had served my cousin, and none of whom liked me. It was a hard and bitter life. It galled me when I rode through the village to see the peasant children shrink away from me. I have seen old women cross themselves stealthily as I passed them by. Strange reports had gone forth about me, and there were those who whispered that I had given my soul to the evil one as the price of my cousin's heritage. From my boyhood I had been dark of visage and stern of manner, and hence, perhaps, no woman's love had ever been mine. I remembered my mother's face in all its changes of expression, but I can remember no look of affection that ever shone on me. That other woman beneath whose feet I laid my heart was pleased to accept my homage, but she never loved me and the end was treachery. I had grown hateful to myself and had well nigh begun to hate my fellow creatures when a feverish desire seized upon me and I pined to be back in the press and throng of the busy world again. I went back to Paris where I kept myself aloof from the court and where an angel took compassion upon me. She was the daughter of an old comrade, a man whose merits had been neglected, whose achievements had been ignored, and who sulked in his shabby lodging like a rat in a hole. While all Paris went mad with the Scotch financier, the gentlemen and lackeys were trampling one another to death in the Rue Quincampoix. The only child of this little cross-grained old captain of dragoons was an incarnate sunbeam whose mortal name was Evelyn du Chalet. She loved me. The richest blessings of our lives are often those which cost us least. 
I wasted the best years of my youth in the worship of a wicked woman who jilted and cheated me at last. I gave this meek angel but a few courteous words, a little fraternal tenderness, and lo, she loved me. The life which had been so dark and desolate grew bright beneath her influence, and I went back to Poy Verdun with a fair young bride for my companion. Ha! How sweet a change there was in my life and in my home! The village children no longer shrank appalled as the dark horsemen rode by. The village crones no longer crossed themselves, for a woman rode by his side, a woman whose charities had won the love of all those ignorant creatures, and whose companionship had transformed the gloomy lord of the chateau into a loving husband and a gentle master. The old retainers forgot the untimely fate of my cousin and served me with cordial willingness for love of their young mistress. No words which can tell the pure and perfect happiness of that time. I felt like a traveller who had traversed the frozen seas of an arctic region remote from human love or human companionship to find himself on a sudden in the bosom of a verdant valley, in the sweet atmosphere of home. The change seemed too bright to be real, and I strove in vain to put away from my mind the vague suspicion that my new life was but some fantastic dream. So brief were these halcyon hours that, looking back on them now, it is scarcely strange if I am still half inclined to fancy the first days of my married life could have been no more than a dream. Neither in my days of gloom nor in my days of happiness had I been troubled by the recollection of André's blasphemous oath. The words which with his last breath he had whispered in my ear were vain and meaningless to me. He had vented his rage in those idle threats as he might have vented it in idle execrations. That he will haunt the footsteps of his enemy after death is the one revenge which a dying man can promise himself. And if men had power thus to avenge themselves, the earth would be peopled with phantoms. I had lived for three years at Poiverdun, sitting alone in the solemn midnight by the hearth where he had sat, pacing the corridors that had echoed his footfall. And in all that time my fancy had never so played me false as to shape the shadow of the dead. Is it strange then if I had forgotten Andre's horrible promise? There was no portrait of my cousin at Poiverdun. It was the age of boudoir art and a miniature set in the lid of a gold bonbonniere or hidden artfully in a massive bracelet was more fashionable than a clumsy life-size image fit only to hang on the gloomy walls of a provincial chateau rarely visited by its owner. My cousin's fair face had adorned more than one bonbonniere and had been concealed in more than one bracelet, but it was not among the faces that looked down from the panelled walls of Poiverdun. In the library, I found a picture which awoke painful associations. It was the portrait of a de Brissac who had flourished in the time of Francis I, and it was from this picture that my cousin André had copied the quaint hunting dress he wore at the Regent's Ball. The library was a room in which I spent a good deal of my life, and I ordered a curtain to be hung before this picture. We had been married three months when Evelyn one day asked, Who is the lord of the chateau nearest to this? I looked at her in astonishment. My dearest, I answered, do you not know that there is no other chateau within forty miles of Poiverdun? Indeed, she said, that is strange. I asked her why the fact seemed strange to her, and after much entreaty I obtained from her the reason of her surprise. In her walks about the park and woods during the last month, she had met a man who, by his dress and bearing, was obviously of noble rank. She had imagined that he occupied some chateau near at hand, and that his estate adjoined ours. I was at a loss to imagine who this stranger could be, for my estate of Poiverdun 
lay in the heart of our desolate region. And unless when some traveller's coach went lumbering and jingling through the village, one had little more chance of encountering a gentleman than of meeting a demigod. Have you seen this man often, Evelyn? I asked. She answered in a tone which had a touch of sadness. I see him every day. Where, dearest? Sometimes in the park, sometimes in the wood. You know the little cascade, Hector, where there is some old neglected rock work that forms a kind of cavern. I have taken a fancy to that spot and have spent many mornings there reading. Of late, I have seen the stranger there every morning. He has never dared to address you. Never. I have looked up from my book and have seen him standing at a little distance, watching me silently. I have continued reading, and when I have raised my eyes again, I have found him gone. He must approach and depart with a stealthy tread, for I never hear his footfall. Sometimes I have almost wished that he would speak to me. It is so terrible to see him standing silently there. He is some insolent peasant who seeks to frighten you. My wife shook her head. He is no peasant, she answered. It is not by his dress alone, I judge, for that is strange to me. He has an air of nobility which it is impossible to mistake. Is he young or old? He is young and handsome. I was much disturbed by the idea of this stranger's intrusion on my wife's solitude, and I went straight to the village to inquire if any stranger had been seen there. I could hear of no one. I questioned the servants closely, but without result. Then I determined to accompany my wife in her walks, and to judge for myself of the rank of the stranger. For a week I devoted all my mornings to rustic rambles with Evelyn in the park and woods, and in all that week we saw no one but an occasional peasant in sabots or one of our own household returning from a neighbouring farm. I was a man of studious habits, and those summer rambles disturbed the even current of my life. My wife perceived this and entreated me to trouble myself no further. I will spend my mornings in the plaisance, Hector, she said. The stranger cannot intrude upon me there. I began to think the stranger is only a phantasm of your own romantic brain, I replied smiling at the earnest face lifted to me. A chatelaine who is always reading romances may well meet handsome cavaliers in the woodlands. I dare say I have Mademoiselle Scuderi to thank for this noble stranger, and that he is only the great Cyrus in modern costume. Ah, that is the point which mystifies me, Hector, she said. The stranger's costume is not modern. He looks as an old picture might look if it could descend from its frame. Her words pained me, for they reminded me of that hidden picture in the library and the quaint hunting costume of orange and purple which André de Brassac wore at the Regent's Ball. After this my wife confined her walks to the plaisance, and for many weeks I heard no more of the nameless stranger I dismissed all thought of him from my mind, for a graver and heavier care had come upon me. My wife's health began to droop. The change in her was so gradual as to be almost imperceptible to those who watched her day by day. It was only when she put on a rich gala dress which she had not worn for months that I saw how wasted the form must be on which the embroidered bodice hung so loosely and how wan and dim were the eyes which had once been brilliant as the jewels she wore in her hair. I sent a messenger to Paris to summon one of the court physicians, but I knew that many days must needs elapse before he could arrive at Poiverdun. In the interval I watched my wife with unutterable fear. It was not her health only that had declined, the change was more painful to behold than any physical alteration. The bright and sunny spirit had vanished, and in the place of my joyous young bride, I beheld a woman weighed down by rooted melancholy. 
In vain I sought to fathom the cause of my darling's sadness. She assured me that she had no reason for sorrow or discontent, and that if she seemed sad without a motive, I must forgive her sadness and consider it as a misfortune rather than a fault. I told her that the court physician would speedily find some cure for her despondency, which must needs arise from physical causes, since she had no real ground for sorrow. But although she said nothing, I could see she had no hope or belief in the healing powers of medicine. One day when I wished to beguile her from that pensive silence in which she was wont to sit an hour at a time, I told her, laughing, that she appeared to have forgotten her mysterious cavalier of the wood, and it seemed also as if he had forgotten her. To my wonderment, her pale face became a sudden crimson, and from crimson changed to pale again in a breath. You have never seen him since you deserted your woodland grotto, I said. She turned to me with a heart-rending look. Hector, she cried, I see him every day, and it is that which is killing me. She burst into a passion of tears when she had said this. I took her in my arms as if she had been a frightened child and tried to comfort her. My darling, this is madness, I said. You know that no stranger can come to you in the pleasance. The moat is ten feet wide and always full of water and the gates are kept locked day and night by old Masseux. The chatelaine of a medieval fortress need fear no intruder in her antique garden. My wife shook her head sadly. I see him every day, she said. On this I believed that my wife was mad. I shrank from questioning her more closely concerning her mysterious visitant. It would be ill, I thought, to give a form and substance to the shadow that tormented her by too close inquiry about its looks and manner, its coming and going. I took care to assure myself that no stranger to the household could by any possibility penetrate to the pleasance. Having done this, I was fain to await the coming of the physician. He came at last. I revealed to him the conviction which was my misery. I told him that I believed my wife to be mad. He saw her, spent an hour alone with her, and then came to me. To my unspeakable relief, he assured me of her sanity. It is just possible that she may be affected by one delusion, he said, but she is so reasonable upon all other points that I can scarcely bring myself to believe her the subject of a monomania. I am rather inclined to think that she really sees the person of whom she speaks. She described him to me with a perfect minuteness. The descriptions of scenes or individuals given by patients afflicted with monomania are always more or less disjointed. But your wife spoke to me as clearly and calmly as I am now speaking to you. Are you sure there is no one who can approach her in that garden where she walks? I am quite sure. Is there any kinsman of your steward or hanger-on of your household, a, a young man with a fair womanish face, very pale and rendered remarkable by a crimson scar, which looks like the mark of a blow? My God, I cried, as the light broke in upon me all at once. And the dress, the strange old-fashioned dress? The man wears a hunting costume of purple and orange, answered the doctor. I knew then that André de Brissac had kept his word, and that in the hour when my life was brightest, his shadow had come between me and happiness. I showed my wife the picture in the library, for I would fain assure myself that there was some error in my fancy about my cousin. She shook like a leaf when she beheld it, and clung to me convulsively. This is witchcraft, Hector, she said. The dress in that picture is the dress of the man I see in the pleasance, but the face is not his. Then she described to me the face of the stranger, and it was my cousin's face line for line, Andre de Brissac, whom she had never seen in the flesh, 
Most vividly of all did she describe the cruel mark upon his face, the trace of a fierce blow from an open hand. After this I carried my wife away from Poiverdun. We wandered far through the southern provinces and into the very heart of Switzerland. I thought to distance the ghastly phantom, and I fondly hoped that change of scene would bring peace to my wife. It was not so. Go where we would, the ghost of André de Brassac followed us. To my eyes that fatal shadow never revealed itself. That would have been too poor a vengeance. It was my wife's innocent heart which André made the instrument of his revenge. The unholy presence destroyed her life. My constant companionship could not shield her from the horrible intruder. In vain did I watch her, in vain did I strive to comfort her. He will not let me be at peace, she said. He comes between us, Hector. He is standing between us now. I can see his face with the red mark upon it plainer than I see yours. One fair moonlight night, when we were together in a mountain village in the Tyrol, my wife cast herself at my feet and told me she was the worst and vilest of women. I have confessed all to my director, she said. From the first I have not hidden my sin from heaven, but I feel that death is near me, and before I die I would fain reveal my sin to you. What sin, my sweet one? When first the stranger came to me in the forest, his presence bewildered and distressed me, and I shrank from him as from something strange and terrible. He came again and again. By and by I found myself thinking of him and watching for his coming. His image haunted me perpetually. I strove in vain to shut his face out of my mind. Then followed an interval in which I did not see him, and to my shame and anguish I found that life seemed dreary and desolate without him. After that came the time in which he haunted the pleasance, and, oh, Hector, kill me if you will, for I deserve no mercy at your hands. I grew in those days to count the hours that must elapse before his coming, to take no pleasure save in the sight of that pale face with the red brand upon it. He plucked all old familiar joys out of my heart, and left in it but one weird, unholy pleasure, the delight of his presence. For a year I have lived but to see him, and now curse me, Hector, for this is my sin. Whether it comes of the baseness of my own heart, or is the work of witchcraft, I know not, but I know that I have striven against this wickedness in vain. I took my wife to my breast and forgave her, and soothed, what had I to forgive? Was the fatality that overshadowed us any work of hers? On the next night, she died with her hand in mine, and at the very last she told me, sobbing and affrighted, that he was by her side. A ghastly tale there from Mary Elizabeth Braddon. One which suggests that even death proves no barrier for revenge. If you enjoyed tonight's story, please do consider supporting my work on Patreon. Links in the show notes below. Thanks to everyone who has already shown their support there and joined me on Patreon, but I understand how difficult things are right now. And there are so many amazing podcasts and writers out there that I completely understand if you can't uh, join up there. So don't worry about it. There are other ways to support my work, such as reviewing the Ghastly Tales podcast or subscribing to the YouTube channel, uh, where you'll find loads of great Ghastly Tales and other original content. In the end, if all you can or want to do is sit back and listen to my stories or the classic tales that I read, that's more than enough for me. Time is the most precious of gifts and I'm just honoured that anyone is willing to come with me on these dark little journeys. 
into the macabre. Well, looks like a storm is brewing. Time for you to be on your way once again. But should you ever feel the scourge of revenge coursing through your veins, stay your hand, for the consequences could be disastrous, if not in this life, then the next. Unpleasant dreams, dear listeners, and I'll see you again for another ghastly tale.